Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm quite honored for the heads of uh, the history department and uh, the faculty of arts or choose. There has, been, there has been so much reorganizations that sometimes I get lost <laughs> to know, but uh, congratulations Pamela. And uh, of course I congratulate um, Dr. Mafumbo and uh, it's, it's very nice to, to see former students or people I've examined in the past. I, I do remember you at, uh, at the University of Cape Town. Yeah, so this, this is quite nice to, to see you again. Um, and of course, with Pamela, we've been working on the archives. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you are MA, yes, all right, yeah. Yes, yes. I, I think I did have a PhD at uh, the external examiner. So really, I'm, I'm among friends, although my son is sitting. Uh, uh, before a candle, I think, uh, goes off, uh, it gives some uh, bright light. And I think <laughs> I'm in that situation. I've been working on Abu Mayanja uh, for the last 17 years. I've been uh, doing a lot of work on, on Mayanja. Um, I've, I've been in, on, in the National Archives of the UK for over, for over 20, 25 days working there on, on materials. I've uh, been uh, seeing the archives of Uganda or whatever I could get and interview the people. And I was very pleased when we had yesterday or the other day, when we discussed uh, uh, the book by, um, by Asimwe, because right now, Mayanja fits in the theme of our desire to understand what went wrong? Why, why is our country, why did our country have so much trouble? And why is it that despite the peace we've had for the last 30 years, uh, we are not so sure uh, of, uh, of the road we are traveling. Although we are very happy on the road and things are far much better than they ever have been. So, we need to understand thoroughly. So the book about Mayanja should come out as soon as the publishers have the money to put it out. But meanwhile, I've prepared 10 seminar papers. And when, if you are ready, there will be another one, Abu Mayanja and the packaging of the first Ugandan post-colonial state, 1961 to 1966, which I'm giving a in Miser next week, and I would like you to, to come. But this one starts us off uh, uh, the, the whole process of nation building, the whole process of what went wrong uh, in Uganda and other countries. So we look at education. Why was uh, Mayanja? given a scholarship, so we go to, we can start now, right. Uh, what I want to say here is the relationship uh, between higher education, development and politics. And it's very important if we are to study nationalism in Uganda to understand that before any management of a state um, is embarked on, you need to have people who understand what it takes to manage a state. So high education um, contributes to the democratic governance by giving the graduates the tools for analyzing all issues there are. This does not mean that people who have not been to uh, higher education institutions don't, don't analyze political issues. Indeed, they do. But the more 
of highly educated people you have, the better. So high education also enhances the forward upward mobility of groups and societies. So education, therefore, higher education is a political issue. Um, I should have got it, but <laughs> it supports knowledge-based economic development through general training of the labor force and advanced uh, training linked to a country's innovation system. And it, it strengthens the lower levels of higher education of the, of the whole education system. Despite what they tell us that uh, the lower education systems are important, we should fund the UPE and all that. In fact, most of the activities that improve an education system uh, are planned, designed by higher education people. So the, it also equips society with the knowledge that they need uh, to go on. Now, let's go to the colonial administrative attitude. Yeah, right. Because higher education is key to understanding, to manage the nature of things, it's always a political issue. So in a colonial society, Africans were believed not to have the capacity uh, to imbibe higher education. So that by the time Congo got independence, for example, there were three graduates in the whole country. Uh, Uganda, I think, had about between 150 and 200. Now imagine, how do you manage a country with so few graduates when you actually need the graduates in, in, the, in medicine, you need them in, as teachers, you need them as broadcasters, as engineers, you need them to think for society. So colonial office rejected these findings, but it was very difficult. So there are, they feared sending uh, abroad African students uh, because they didn't like them to get ideas of this loyalty. For example, Obote's scholarship was stopped by the district officer at, uh, at Elida saying that Uganda did not need lawyers. He was registered here as a student in the Department of English and he got a scholarship and resigned before he was sure. And so his scholarship was terminated. They didn't allow him to go. Um, the governor, I think it was Archer, uh, devised the system of controlling the issuing of passports of Uganda students. However, things were changing a lot. Uh, there were those who said, okay, we must build institutions for them. And so uh, Judge Asquith was commissioned in 1943, 45. He presented his report in 1945 or later on to find the colleges within the empire, particularly in Africa, where local highly educated elite collaborators would be educated. And these colleges were Makerere, Furabe, Khartoum, Ibadan, the West Indies, uh, I think there were five. They were founded after the Asquith report. Having found them, the colonial officers also 
wanted to monitor what was going on in the universities. So in 1947, the governor of Kenya objected to what one lecturer here at Makerere called Mary Parker, who was teaching in classes and asked the principal, Dr. William Lamont, to dismiss Mary Parker. The principal refused. So the three governors met and told the principal to, to dismiss Mary Parker. The principal, William Lamont, refused. He said, if you do that, I resign. I must protect Makerere on the institutional ground, institutional autonomy ground. And they saw he resigned. And Mary Park also lost her job. So not only was uh, the uh, high education control, but uh, for those who the students were stopped from going abroad or were carefully screened, but even here, the, the, the governors wanted the control. After 1947, uh, governors were very careful uh, on how they dealt with the Makerere, East Africa, and other uh, colonial institutions, and the Hatun, the Baden, Pura Bay, and the West Indies. So, next. So we come to 1947. Uh, um, I wanted to, to say that Uganda got independence without shedding blood. Those who say they struggled to get independence for Uganda are liars. There was no struggle here. Independence was given to Ugandans on a silver platter. Sir Benjamin uh, Cohen came with a view of preparing Uganda for independence. Why did he do that? For many of the historians, you know that there was, uh, we, I think we have omitted one. Can you go back? No, you are right. You're on the right page. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Rugadism or indirect rule, in 1947, Sir Andrew Cohen and the Secretary of State, mind you, this was the Labour government, agreed to change the policy of indirect rule to govern Africa with and empower educated elites. And the plan is also envisaged to start the democratization of local councils and the local governments, and to include educated Africans in the legal cause, and slowly grant the latter councils more powers, and prepare self-government uh, in a generation or two. Now, this Mayanja met Ma Jare Paham, and in a letter, Ma Jare Paham wrote to Sir Keith Hancock and shared the ring at that time, Sir Andrew Cohen at the colony office. They thought that independence was, would probably, I mean, self government would probably come in 20 years from 1952. And so they had a plan to decolonize. That was 1947. This was due to the impact of World War I. World War I impoverished the great uh, powers so that the France, Britain, uh, the UK could not afford it to hold on to colonies. And opinion was uh, changing very fast within, within the imperial powers. And the people were not really as imperialistic as they wanted. And so Sir Andrew Cohen and his boss 
uh, decided on a strategy to free Africa, but more carefully. So they put up his plans. In 1947, a dispatch was sent to all the colonies asking the governors to democratize the local councils. So let's go to the other one. Now, the governor of Uganda, Sir Andrew Cohen, came when he was very, uh, very upbeat. He wanted to prepare Uganda for independence. And he visited all parts. And one, I think the Mukam of Bunyoro pointed out that many of the governors of Uganda who have come to visit me, to visit the Western region, have come to see animals. But you are the first governor who has come and see people. They used to go to the national parks and stop there. So he worked to modernize Uganda's economic and political system as a united country using the ideas of Lord Haley and the Fabian Colonial Bureau. Uh, the Fabian Colonial Bureau was a, an organization within the Labour Party, associated with the Labour Party, who felt that imperialism, the only good thing about imperialism is to prepare the, wealth to, the welfare of the people who live in those countries. Otherwise, it is exploitation. And therefore, the uh, UK should prepare these colonies uh, to get independence and also develop their economy. But he established the, the, the UDC. He extended the railway to Kilembe Mines. He built uh, roads and was generous to a high education. He built the community development. Virtually everything you see in Uganda or you saw in Uganda has the, the mark of this governor. You would say he was possibly the, the nationalist of Uganda, but he had a bigger plan for the UK. He was given a small, he, when the Labour government was defeated, he lost his job in the colonial office. And so the conservative called him to be governor of Uganda, which he took and really wanted to make Uganda a model. Alas, he made a roadblock in Uganda where the Kawaka refused to democratize his assemblies or participate in the Central Council, unless Uganda's status was assured. And this is what we were discussing in the Asuimwe paper, that Uganda has that problem where there is already an entity, a nation that was developed with the king. And Motesa didn't know that the British government had quietly changed its mind on traditional rulers, that Britain was ready to go out, but no capacity to stay in the colonies. The colonies had to go on their own. Africans didn't know. And Mayanja, whom I'm studying, was a participant in all this, but he didn't know that the British wanted to decolonize. And uh, unlike Kenya, Zimbabwe, uh, Algeria, not a single person died struggling for independence in Uganda. Independence was handed to us. All right, so he meets, he finds a death, a death, not a death, please a death of educated Africans to, to, to implement his plans. Not only did he meet problems with the uh, traditional rulers, not all of them, but at least the, the, the most powerful, but they want the educated people to work with. And so when he had Mayanja, he was very pleased that every educated person should get. So can we go to the next one? the death of educated Africans to implement his ideas. Now, having located Mayanja, Sir Andrew Cohen decided to educate him because as he put it, 
in the colonial society where Kileva nationalists are at a premium and where all sorts of pressure are liable to be put on them, his qualities may, may well be damaged unless they are made use of and so forth. And so he worked out to give him a scholarship. And that scholarship was fat because his, his mother, his, Mayanja's mother and sister were also beneficiaries of the scholarship. And very few Africans, of course, were being taken to, uh, uh, to, to, to Cambridge. Now, the, 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 sec, the chief secretary pointed out that Mayanja was the most brilliant student the protected had ever produced. Yeah. At that time, <laughs> well, Mayanja took eight subjects and he got, in every one of them, he got distinction in one. And when he came to Makerere, he, he got the governor's prize, which was the, most, the person who gets the most marks from the art side. He took mathematics, history, and, uh, and English. And uh, he, he excelled in those uh, subjects, but he was also naughty and led a strike, uh, a food strike, and he was expelled from Makerere. And uh, he, while he was a student, he founded the Uganda's first political party, the Uganda uh, National Congress, with Musaz, but he wrote most of the documents. Uh, actually, if that's why, Pamela, we need to open the archives because these documents are in the archives and they are in his handwriting, some, a lot of them. But, but this is the archives in London. I haven't looked here. I've looked at the, the archives in London, they're in his handwriting. And it is very interesting. He was a graduate student here. He was the secretary to the you know, minister of whatever information, whatever it is, but he was also secretary to the guild and also editor of the Macarellian. It wasn't at that time called Macarellian. So he was very, very busy and then excelled in class and being fast. So uh, when he was given a scholarship, the uh, the protectorate, can we go next? Uh, the oligarch, yeah. The oligarch and the colonial administration were infuriated by the governor's granting a scholarship to him. They didn't understand because they were not aware, most of the junior officers, that Governor Cohen had actually come to give to, 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 to prepare Uganda for independence and therefore to make them lose their jobs. And so they were very unhappy about his giving a scholarship to Mayanja. But these are all interrelated. But the lesson we learn from here is that there were very few educated people who could handle the situation. And for them, they thought that they were not, uh, they, they were not privy to the colonial office's uh, decolonization plan. And so they could not sympathize. Now, my fellow historians, really to understand this period, there are a number of original documents which district officers have written. There are two books online of one reflections of the uh, district officers by Douglas. I, 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 I should have brought them. And another one by a police officer at Kilembe, written originally. You could see that they were not aware at all that the governor and the colonial office was going to deprive them of jobs by giving Africa its independence. 
And so they were very, very angry that my angel should get uh, a scholarship. Now, other groups opposed were, of course, the Indian dominated Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I think one of you asked, you, you asked about the Indian question. The Indian question is very important because at that time, like the local traditional elites, the Indians were asking, what is our place? And Mayanja was saying that there should be no special reservations uh, for any social groups. And that's how he upset Uganda. So the Uganda didn't like him at all. And as next week we shall be discussing how Mayanja packaged the instruments, all the that brought that gave Uganda independence. He packaged the 1962 constitution. The virtual alone, he, he was working between Motes and, uh, and Obote, uh, and negotiating, and then writing, and then the, you would produce a document. Uh, so that's, that's the paper I want to discuss uh, next week at Maiza, how he, he used his influence. Uh, well, he called Obote from Kenya and worked with him in the National Congress. When it, it came to getting elected, he refused. He said, Obote, you, you take over. Me, me, I'm not the type. And I think he knew himself very well. Then we shall discuss that later. So eventually, Mayanja went to Cambridge. I think next. Mayanja eventually went to Cambridge. Uh, but his journey was monitored. The colonial, the colonial officers in Entebbe did not want him to meet labor people, people from the labor party, from the Fabian groups or African organized groups. So they organized the British Council to meet him and the Bishop Stewart to meet him in London. However, Bishop Stewart was late in reaching the, the airport and the British Council didn't show up and the, the labor people met him first. And uh, they were, uh, the Ugandan protective officials were not at all pleased. And uh, so the education was monitored and Sir Andrew Cohen was very brilliant in the sense that he sent Mayanja for colonial reasons. And the reasons were he wanted to create a collaborating independent nationalist group. But when Mayanja went into to Cambridge, they could not control him. When he had finished most of the law degrees. He escaped from London and he went to Russia. So this one, I was able to to uh, to bring a photograph, a photo, a photograph of him uh, with the Khrushchev, the president of Russia. <laughs> so he was a naughty boy, and uh, so so they were they were not able to control him. But the aim, the politics of education in the colonial society uh, was that if you educate the Africans, you must not educate them beyond a point where they would question the status quo, where they would be uppish, and where to, the, to people like Benjamin Cohen, Sir Andrew Cohen, where they would be anti-Western. They wanted to create uh, independent Uganda, I mean, uh, independent African countries that were within the British Commonwealth or the French Union without very much opposing 
the status quo. And as I say, uh, uh, he became, Sir Andrew Cohen didn't make a mistake. Mayanja became the most outspoken defender of Western govern governance values embedded in the concept of the separation of power of the three branches of government. One of the, uh, I, I hope to discuss Mayanja's concept on the constitution. And he, he attributed the mismanagement of the state affairs to the denseness of those in the power. The parliamentary uh, hazards or records indicate how Mayanja used to abuse straight the members of on the opposite side, including the president himself. See, today they, they are working on their heads. Today they slept too much and so forth. And so, but at the same time, he depended the concept of the separation of powers uh, very, very much. And uh, so Sir Benjamin Cohen was not, uh, was, uh, was not uh, incorrect in sending Mayanja to one of the best universities uh, in the, that the imperial power could provide. And Cohen himself had gone to Cambridge. So Uganda's mismanagement, and I hope, I wish Asuma had been here, can be reflected in the death absence of educated people, highly educated people who understand how a state is managed. And Cohen realized this. But it was indeed the fault, you can say, of the imperial power for not, for having been hostile to African higher education. Because without higher education, it's almost impossible to manage a modern state. And when Uganda got independence, there were just not a enough people to manage this state. Congo was worse because they focused mainly on primary schools. So universal primary education is okay. We should have it. But higher education is the backbone of the whole educational system because they make the curriculum, they make the laws, they treat the patients, most of the things that you need to manage a state are performed by people with higher education. And so that's why there was the politics. I think it, the leadership of the Democrat, I mean of the Labour Party agreed. And Sir Andrew Cohen is typifies, typifies the thinking of the intelligent British people that uh, you have to educate uh, your enemies, you have to educate people who are going to take their affairs of the state. So there was a change in the colonial policy in 1947. The colonial policy needed highly educated people. They weren't any because previous colonial practice was to deter Africans from getting higher education abroad and uh, controlling that which was given inside. So that by the, when they found that they cannot hold the colonies together, and when they had changed from collaborating with the traditional elites to educated elites. There were no educated elites. And Mayanja was a beneficiary of one of the scholarships 
one of that uh, scramble, you might say, to get highly educated people to manage the state. And a part of the mismanagement that the substance of Asimwe's book, and partly the failing of the Uganda state or the difficulties we have in consolidating was that initially the managers of our state were not highly educated. The other day I was uh, attacked when I said that about his highest uh, certificate was the, the school certificate, the O level. I'm sorry to have said that, but it is true. You know, it is true. So most of the people we had as ministers at that time, about 70% did not have degrees. They were school teachers, veterinary officers, like the vice president, Rahi Babiha. Most of them had completed the levels. And so the complexity, the sheer complexity of managing the state was a problem. So thank you very much. I don't think I have anything more. Thank you so much for that, uh, the fascinating presentation that combined with the paper as well. Uh, and I think I'd just like to hand it over directly to our discussants uh, to, to, uh, to comment on, on the paper. Um, could I ask first Dr. Ruta Bajuka to um, uh, raise questions, comments, uh, and so forth, and then uh, Dr. Sakito after that. Oh, you, you have to yeah. just uh, okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Oh, um, uh, Dr. Edgar Teira, the coordinator of the Department of History, Archaeology and Heritage Studies uh, uh, seminars, organizing this very, very uh, critical uh, seminar. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Professor Kasozi, for uh, this very, very serious work. Uh, we can't uh, thank you enough because uh, I think that uh, uh, it um, helps us to um, pause and ask ourselves where we are in um, this um, on this question of higher education. Uh, where well, I think there are a number of uh, points that are in the paper, which uh, um, uh, well, people have read, and I'm sure they um, can relate to very, very um, well. But uh, I'd like to start from uh, um, the very question of. Um, higher education provisioning as political and has hence uh, controlled in quality and quantity. And um, um, well, uh, probably in the larger work, uh, Professor Kasozi has uh, expounded on this, but um, um, I would probably want to see a little more of this uh, political engagement. Um, I'll come back to this uh, when I uh, talk about uh, Mayanja's uh, work at the UNC. Um, so, um, Uh, yeah, this is uh, 
we, we see this occurring, recurring, uh, not only during the colonial, uh, sorry, not only during the um, colonial period, but the after. I think that um, the African university is probably the 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 the, the most um, contested over the site of struggle. I don't think that there is any African campus, post-colonial campus, which doesn't have um, uh, blood littered, uh, you know, uh, all over it, including Makerere here. Don't know how much blood has been shed on Makerere, on, on Makerere Hill. And uh, all that, uh, I think, uh, underlining the political uh, struggles that uh, uh, are within uh, this uh, education sphere. Uh, the decolonization process, I think, has been uh, very, very well um discussed by uh, uh professor kasozi the protagonists the preparations by the colonial um office uh so we are not uh, uh so much on that but uh, i want to pick a point about uh, the educated elite uh being uh, prepared to take over uh, the uh, from the colonialists um, at the end of the of formal colonialism vis-a-vis uh, -vis the old elite, the chiefs, and the debate that um, uh, raged on uh, and the reforms that uh, happened uh so it's probably just it was probably not a very easy choice um there must have been uh, uh, some underlying uh, factors and um there are theorists like um uh franz fanon for example uh who zero in on the petty bourgeoisie and their position in society and how uh, unrooted they are and uh, read the tools for uh, imperials vis-a-vis -vis the old guard, the chiefs who were anchored, who had um, stakes in um, wealth and property and who could have been much more um, problematic to manipulate given the kind of uh, relationship that the uh, colonial, uh, I mean, the colonials envisaged after formal colonialism ended, as uh, Professor Kasozi has um, uh, pointed out. Uh, Abu Mayanj, um, uh, is uh, given to us in a, uh, a very good dose. Uh, Mayanja, a very brilliant student at Ibudo, both academically uh, at Ibudo and Makerere College, uh, very um, astute academically, but also um, an active student politically. And uh, yes, both uh, hinted on, but uh, again, uh, um, we look forward to the presentation next week, where I think that uh, a bit of detail is going to be um, brought out. So as a ring leader in student strikes, uh, leading to his expulsion, uh, from Makerere in 1952. And then uh, the special arrangement for him to go and study at uh, um, Cambridge, uh, the colonial state breaking almost all the rules to ensure that uh, 
is cutted as quickly as possible. The justification for this uh, professed, but probably the key, the most underlying um, reasons may be not as professed, which I suspect. Um, I, I, I will I also note uh, uh, this point about uh, guardianship required for any student going to study abroad in Britain. And uh, I'm wondering why, why this guardianship, what was it read about? Was it a continuation of paternalism that colonialism was uh, founded upon? Uh, I think uh, um, the management of uh, the, the tension and uh, the, the, the um, preparations for Abu Mayanja's travel and the care taken to make sure that he doesn't meet certain people, the labor officials, uh, could uh, be um, brought closer in terms of discussion with this guardianship. And uh, then probably we understand why this was uh, really that critical. Um, then uh, I also ask a small question about uh, the politics of higher education, whether this was uh, one-sided. We don't see the struggles within uh, the colonies, within Uganda, for, for instance, uh, the demand for higher education. We probably um, need a point or two about this. Um, we want to know the nature of politics that Abu Mayanja participated in as Secretary General of the Uganda National Congress. Um, so as Secretary General, what was his role? And uh, I would like to invite, uh, I mean, Professor Kasosi to look at uh, this question to see whether it makes sense. So could this have been the main reason for the apparent favors to him cutted to Cambridge so fast by the colonial authorities, uh, given that uh, um, if you look at some of those quotations, there are some keywords in there which seem to um, portray the uh, the fears that uh, um, I'm uh, uh, asking this from the uh, standpoint of uh, uh, Gramsci's uh, idea of uh, an organic intellectual and how the colonial um, the, the the colonial authorities he knew that uh, yes. Um, exposure to uh, ideas of democracy and uh, uh, other Western ideas of modernity might um, preempt the militant nationalism that uh, was uh, underway and which Abu Mayanja had demonstrated very ably that he was part of leading strikes to these schools and um, uh, being a, a founder of uh, a, a, a political party, Uganda National Congress, and becoming its secretary uh, general. Um, I would also want the, again, this is uh, probably in the larger work, but uh, um, in a, a presentation that we have, uh, we don't have a glimpse of Bob Mayanja's ideas uh, in the, some of the uh, publications to which he contributed, which uh, uh, cited. Uh, we don't uh, at this point see what Bob Mayanja believed in, his convictions generally. So, um, Again, uh, um, 
maybe this is to preempt, but uh, at the end of the day, I would love to see Abmayanja speak, and would love to hear um, his voice in this fascinating story. Uh, so uh, uh, those are the brief uh, remarks that I have. Thank you, and I, I think we'll take both discussions uh, in order, and then Professor Kasozi can respond to as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kasovi, uh, for this uh, fascinating piece of work. It is indeed very interesting, actually. Uh, it comes at a time um, when, to be precise, last month, the university governing body, which is the council, university council visited uh, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, in the Q&A, one of uh, the council members asked, what went wrong? We used to have vibrant uh, men in social sciences, the likes of uh, the late uh, uh, Professor Apollo Svambi were there, the likes of Mukwaya, the likes made mention of quite a number of names. And I uh, was asking why is the silence uh, that Makila is no longer vibrant as it used to be. And uh, one of uh, the members present was courageous enough and he actually said, you mean when you overfish, the desired fish remains there? Um, that uh, the desired fish has already been fished out by the state. So don't expect. And those that have remained, that's God has no issue. Yes. Sorry, sorry. That uh, the government has fished what used to be. Um, the loudest voices that would inform and image higher education with particular reference to Makere University. Um, so this paper is very interesting talking about uh, Abmayanja and uh, the nexus between um, higher education involvement and politics and how politics is used to manage higher education for its betterment. Um, in the words of uh, Apollo Makubuya, he calls up Mayanja a restive pan-Africanist. And you don't know how restive he was, but uh, it may happen to see some ideas drawing on a professor's paper. Um, Education, higher education is a political agenda. It has a political agenda. It is a political arrangement. And uh, this is spelled out clearly uh, in your paper, although implicitly. Um, I, however, have some reservations. One, the use of uh, the term controversial, the politics of higher education in a colonial setting, the controversial sending of Abu Mayanja. And I would love to know 
like any other person. Why do you call this the controversial sending? Already, there was the 1947 decolonization or exit plan. And therefore, it wasn't early because the other one was 1947, which has been dispatched to the colonies. And now Mayanja is being sent as a brilliant person to King's College and then Cambridge. So what makes it controversial, the sending of this person? Controversial. Was it uh, because initially it was supposed to be uh, the Secretary of State to do the granting of scholarships? But again, it was on the recommendation of uh, um, the council and the governor. And this time it is actually the governor who is asking for this scholarship for Abmayanja. So what makes it controversial descending of Abmayanja? Then uh, Prof also, we need to have some clarity. While people have praised Andrew Cohen, as a nationalist for Uganda, like you have put it, one wonders whether this is true. When you read the works of Professor Mabdan, he says, uh, for example, that between 1951 and 1961, the politics of decolonization was characterized by attempts at Africanizing the civil service. Thus, a national university became an obligatory sign of real independence. Having sacked Abmayanja or expelled him from Makere University, and now Andrew Cohen comes in and does not ask for a scholarship for Mayanja to go to the University of London but rather Cambridge. Why was it University of Cambridge and not London, University of London, which already had a link, they had formed an alliance or collaboration with McKinley as early as 1950? Wasn't Cambridge the center of uh, indoctrination? because we happen to see this brilliant person coming back at a time when um, Uganda needed nationalists to forge forward, but doesn't engage so much in politics, but instead goes to Chivuli to become kind of head teacher and the like. Was becoming a head teacher a better position for such a brilliant brain than leading the decolonization struggle. Then, Professor, there is also need some for some clarity. Like you put it in your presentation, that the junior officers were surprised when Cohen granted a scholarship or asked for a scholarship for uh, Abmayanja. Why would these be surprised? Yet Britain had already issued the 1947 plan exit policy, for which, although you don't spell out clearly in your work, it needs to come out clearly that Andrew Cohen himself was one of the key architects of this policy. So why would these junior officers get surprised when Andrew Cohen undertook uh, such a, a decision. And uh, it, it appears in your work here to some we have had in Roma. Um, one of those who could not qualify to go for the further studies was uh, Obote, as you put it here, and say did not have certificates beyond the current A levels. 
but we have continued to hear the late addressed as Dr. Apollo Milton Obote. Can you kindly put for us at least a footnote and explain to us how Obote now becomes a doctor, a person who did not have uh, certificates beyond the current era. It may appear simplistic, but not. Um, Chair, Dr. Diga, thank you very much. I submit for now. Thank you very much for those uh, those great questions and comments and observations. And uh, Professor Kasozi, I think if, if you can respond to as many of those as you as you would like to, and then we'll afterwards we'll open up for questions from the audience. Let me start with the last person because I can remember very well what you said. I didn't say that Obote was not qualified to go abroad or to study. Um, all, all I said is that what he, uh, his level, his, what he got, where he stopped, was the, 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 certificate, the highest certificate he has is a level. It doesn't mean that if you don't get a PhD, you're not capable of doing it. Obote was very brilliant. He got a scholarship to study law and he was prevented from going because of the administrative uh, um, dislike of Africans going abroad, right? So they call him a doctor because he got uh, uh, this degree, uh, what the doctor of laws, honorary degrees. Yeah, honorary degrees, yeah. So I'm, I didn't say he wasn't brilliant. He was very good actually. And he, 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 you know, he, he succeeded, but he made a mistake of resigning before the scholarship was through. So that's one. The other point about Cohen, whether he knew about the 1947, I think I said that he is the one with the Secretary of State who drew up the plan when he was Deputy Assistant Secretary in the colonial office. Now, this was during the Labour government from 1950 to 1952, no, from 1945 to 1951, when the Labour government was in power, right? Rich Jones recruited him as assistant secretary. Now, 1950, the Labour won, but with a small majority. So they went back to the election and the Labour was thrown out. And Sir Andrew Cohen also was thrown out. But the conservatives knew he was a good person. So they gave him a job, and that job was to be governor of Uganda. He is the one who had actually drew, drawn the, the, the 1947 plan when he was the assistant secretary. So he knew about it. Now, the next question. Uh, the, the plan wasn't advertised. The junior officers didn't know because they thought, the colonial office thought it would uh, give them a decent incentive. They, they had spent all their time working as colonial officers and you don't tell them that you will be Africanized. So they didn't tell them, it wasn't known. So because of that, there are many, uh, many officers, the junior officers, didn't know what was going on. And they were surprised at the speed at which Uganda was going towards independence. But Cohen and the top groups within the government, the, the chief secretaries, knew what was going on. And uh, so he knew what was going on. His next officers knew, but they couldn't say it. Now, the other one, why was Mayanga sent to Cambridge and not to London? Uh, well, two things, two reasons, I think. Uh, Sir Andrew Cohen had gone to Cambridge and got a, a double first class degree from there, from Trinity College. And so he knew what, the, the any university he knew was what? Cambridge. So he sent him to Cambridge. Secondly, 
One of the reasons the, the Sir Bernard D. Bansen, who was principal of Makerere, wrote to the governor, and I saw seen that letter, that Mayanji is too brilliant to, to operate here in Africa in ordinary uh, students. He will finish, uh, you know, he doesn't need to attend classes, but he will come always fast. He needs people he can compete with. And the governor wrote saying, this, this young man needs people he can compete with. And those who are only at Cambridge, <laughs> not in London. <laughs> yeah, this, that is, is in writing by the Prince of Makerere, you know, that he's just too, too, too good, you know, too good for, for London. He needed Cambridge. And in Cambridge, his tutor says this, his work is too much above, above average. But he doesn't attend lectures, and we don't see him. But when he when you produce his work is much above average, above the average, and he got a very good upper second. Just missed the first class. So you are talking of somebody uh, very very different. And so Cohen met him. Uh, there was a delegation, a delegation of the Uganda National Congress, which went to see the governor. And Cohen writes, and I haven't included it here, writes to the Cambridge University asking for a place. But I had a chance to, to meet, my, to meet the, the National Congress. And Mayanja was the sole speaker, being the cleverest of them. He impressed all of us. And we, we, we inquired as who, who this person was. And we, we were told he was an expelled student. And that's. You know, he says this this man must be educated, and he adds, "We must educate our detractors." He, you know, he, because he was such a human. Sir Andrew Cohen was himself, as you say, brilliant. He got a, a double fast, and he ended up as a permanent secretary uh, of overseas development, uh, and he achieved all that. I think he died by the time he died. I think he was 49, wasn't he, Moses? He was a very young man when he died. So, Sir Andrew Cohen. Yeah, he was a very young man. He got, you know, he, he became a sir. He was knighted at 29, I understand. You know, so his, his father was, his family was Jewish, but he, he converted uh, to Anglicanism. He was a Christian. So, the, the sending of Mayanja was controversial. I was looking at the social groups within Uganda. I was looking at the European officers. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't know that independence was coming. And the book I am talking about of the district officers, about, uh, uh, the, there are about 200 essays by district officers. It's just come out, but it's private written. They all didn't know what was going on. And they were not told that we are preparing Africa for independence. This plan was top secret, except the governors knew it. And their immediate uh, subordinates, like the chief secretary, the secretary for African affairs, the secretary for social affairs, and those, those knew it, but the others didn't know. And, and the Africans actually didn't know. Mayanja confesses that we didn't know independence would come so, so early. So no, they didn't know. That's why it was, uh, it is, I call it controversial. And it was never published. Um, now, I don't call Cohen a nationalist, no. He was working for the UK. They wanted to create uh, uh, African states that were friendly to the United Kingdom. He brought up the idea of the Commonwealth, Sir Andrew Cohen, a, a, where you have English speaking nations in the same group, but friendly. That was their aim. They were, he was not a nationalist. But he did a lot because he wanted to prepare Uganda for independence. He, you know, he built the UDC 
He built the dam. He built the railways that went west. This governor did most of the things that you see in Uganda were done. And, uh, and he was lucky because when he came, Uganda had saved a lot of money and the coffee price was very high. There was money to invest and he did invest it. And because he was from labor, he believed in the state intervention into the market. He was not a free marketeer as such, a completely free market here. So that's right. Now, let me go to the first. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joka. I, I want to take you to the point. You said that uh, you wanted to know more about Mayanja. Uh, I have the following. This is the first seminar, right? The next seminar is Abu Mayanja and the packaging of the first Ugandan post-colonial state. That's next Wednesday. That is where I will deal with those ideas. Then the third one, which I want to do in September, they state that Abu Mayanja wished Uganda to become a liberal democracy. That, that is, that's another seminar prepared. Then the fourth one will be Mayanja's philosophy of a constitution fit for Uganda. The fifth, the type of unity of the state Mayanja preferred uh, to have for his home homeland. The structures, then the sixth would be the structures and functions of government. Mayanja envisaged for post-colonial Uganda. He believes that the government being the power of the state and the agents of the state, uh, it, it should be a liberal democratic uh, government. And uh, then seven, Mayanja's views on the roles of the administration of justice. Actually, he's, he's at peace. We were talking about law. And uh, then the Mayanja's philosophy of the nature of education, then Mayanja's views on agriculture, and then the Muslim question. So I prepared, and they are ready, 10 seminars on Mayanja. So this is the first one. And the, the, the first one was intended to start him off, right? To having education. So th that's why. Uh, I agree with you that you would like to hear about it. So we will meet next Wednesday. Oh, most people will have gone for Easter, but that's the spot I could get. Now you ask what was the guardianship for? You see, the higher education, Europeans opposed Africans getting higher education or didn't like it. As I say, DHL got that say that they me he measured over 3,000 African craniums and, and found that the, the, their craniums were very small. So they, they didn't have the capacity to absorb higher education. Uh, there was that group of people who believed that Africans could not get what? Education. Then there was another group of people within the colonial system who believed that they will be uh, apish. They, they want to, to be equal to the white people. To, so they didn't want to educate them. You, you bring a, an African doctor to work with me, a European doctor, he will say we are equal. We can't be equal, right? I, I, I see it in, uh, you can see it uh, uh, in, the, uh, in New York or anywhere on the road. A police officer arrests a, a black, um, Doctor, he just, when you saw him, you say, what? He just doesn't believe that you are what you are. So there was that, that group of people. And there were very many in Uganda because when Makerere went on food strike, uh, the, 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 the dean of students was called McPherson, the husband of Margaret. He had Mary Ford. Uh, she, a European to cook matoke for Africans. And she didn't know. And she used to say, you monkeys, she called her workers monkeys. And so the, you, had, you had a racist within the group, but they were not all. And then of course you had people who were very enlightened, you know, like Goldthorpe and all others, and the Debasse. So you had a, a collection of people. And then the Indian groups, and then, surprisingly, the Uganda government 
said, my anger was a rebel. He should go, he should be thrown in prison. But the Kabaka and the governor said, no, we can't waste this prey. We must send him abroad. And the, and the principal of Makerere himself, he wanted him, you know, he wanted him educated. Uh, and I wrote the letter to the, to the governor. But uh, yes, the person who led the strike against me is the most brilliant person. We can't waste this person. That, that was the, the principal of the college. So that was the point. Um, so the reason for influencing higher education is that it is in higher education where products, human products, that shape society are baked. And the colonial officers wanted to create people who would not condemn the colonial system and would stay within the British Commonwealth, not rebels uh, who, would, who would overturn uh, Western, Western, Western values. So that's why my, they preferred Mayanja, when he go, went to abroad, they made sure that he stayed in, or he was met by Bishop Stewart, who was the Bishop of Uganda. And the people like that, not, not rebels. But unfortunately, Bishop Stewart was not there, and he met Azikiwe, Sese Kama, and other, all these rebels. <laughs> I think, I think that's all I, I have to add. You did what? No, he did it. The bishop had a, a, a meeting uh, of, uh, yeah, right, as you, you remember. Yeah, right. He didn't manage to go. But he sent somebody to meet him. Yeah, but his, his wife, Mary Stewart, uh, also dodged these guys because they came looking for Mayanja. And my, my, and she said, Mayanja is not here, and after here, he will go to, uh, he will go straight to school in Cambridge. And uh, so she, she went away. I think Mary Stewart, that's the woman who, who that, that's all is, is named, the box is, is named. She was very brilliant. She said, Mayanja is not here. So they, you know, you be, it's like you don't like your children to run with the people you don't, whose ideas you don't approve of. And mind you, a number of colonial officers thought Africans were grown up children. So they, still, they believe in that. And uh, you don't blame them sometimes when you meet people who are less educated and you see their ideas on that on things. So this is a long journey I've been taking and uh, Moses knows for the last 17 years I've been on this and uh, uh, the, the book is about about 500 pages. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah. yeah, it should be coming. Right? Yeah, it is, it is really a, an analysis of the politics of Uganda. Uh, and I was very, very pleased with the Simons starting because I think the responsibility for us historians is to explain what has happened so that people who are in it, who are determining policy or who will determine policy know what has gone on. So I think if we if we can take some questions, uh, and if I just one thing I have to ask that if you're sitting to the side, you'll have to come up and speak into a microphone so uh, um, the online audience can hear as well. And if you're online, you can use the raise hand button or type it into the chat uh, as well. So Professor Chiguli, would you like to, uh, wherever there's a microphone, uh, if you want to come on the side. Thank you very much. Uh, 
I think Farouk should be here to help us because it's really been, uh, this echo is not so, uh, it doesn't make one comfortable, but thank you very much. I am very pleased to, to hear this um, discussion. Anna. Hope it's not me. It doesn't like. Yes, it just doesn't start the echo. So horrible. Um, thank you very much for this presentation um, and for the discussants. Very um, illuminating um, discussions of the paper. I come to the work. Um, as a literature, a student of literature. So the kind of interest I may be uh, looking out, uh, uh, looking at may not be within the context of this. But since I came here, I speak. I'm also I'm speaking fast because I have to go uh, to my class at four. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I will ask questions, but um, First of all, um, I read the paper, so I'm very intrigued. I did realize that this is an extract from uh, a really big, even when you hadn't yet said, a big um, and more ambitious work. And it is very dense, even as it appears here. Um, and, and so I was uh, really excited about it. Um, my own interests are really uh, that I, uh, as I said, I come to it as a student of literature, so I may be really off course. But um, uh, the things that this paper raises in terms of the themes it raises. Um, um, uh, uh, first of all, the fact that there is this whole thing of higher education for the for, for, for the Africans in order for them to colonize, I mean, to, to take over after the colonial government to, to, to be able to manage um, the state when the colonial government uh, has uh, left versus the other argument that wasn't really very prominent in this paper, but we know is very common of um, what you have been discussing, the argument of, if you give them an education, then they will um, uh, take, take, take control and yet you want to control them. So there is that. And then um, my most, uh, my most, um, what was most interesting for me as a student of literature was the making of a colonial subject and the formation of a post-colonial or what I most comfortably call for me, uh, post-independence actors, that there was this, this in this paper is this narrative of how um, they were, how, how, you, you, how you, you are analyzing the shaping of what, um, for example, the governor saw as the post-independence actor and what kind of post-independence actor did they want um, and, uh, amid, uh, uh, against the backdrop of already making a colonial subject who was supposed to be uh, submissive, who was supposed to be um, not in control. So there is this whole controversy and paradox in this paper. We are making somebody to be in control but the whole narrative has been that somebody should not be in control because the agenda for colonial for colonialism was not for the African to be in control. So you, this this paper becomes complicates this whole um, uh, phenomenon of they have to go, so they have to leave someone in charge. But their agenda was to not to leave anybody in charge. Um, the other thing that comes for me, there are quite a number of issues um, that, that I'm just mentioning them. The other was um, what this paper for me as a literature student, why it was so interesting for me was the, the, narr the narrating of um, the African or the narrative that was put up for the African intellectual from the other point of view. So we have all these um, letters that you are looking at and they are commenting on Abmayanja and uh, constructing the identity of Abmayanja from their own point of view, as opposed to the what probably the African voice would say. 
So um, the whole um, discourse of still colonialism in this paper is very interesting for me. That's where, where um, one of the discussants was talking about the politics of choice, and you also have been talking about it, the politics of choice. Why did, um, why did uh, the governor choose Abmayanja? And I think that um, I agreed with the title. It's controversial. Um, um, why did he choose the, 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 uh, to, to take up Mayanja um, uh, uh, um, to, to, to be educated, for him to come back with the kind of character they had already identified, for him to come back and be part of the people who would control the nation. So for me, issues of identity here and issues of who of positioning are very important. Um, the politics of positioning and the politics of perception. Who are you, who do you perceive this um, subject uh, agent? Because now <laughs> this is my, my my interest that there is the whole narrative of subject as the colonial subject and the whole narrative of the agent as the person who will come and rule the post um, independent state. And so um, I thought that um, this, this, this whole thing probably maybe uh, Professor Letter may be able to tell us a little more and to, 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 to um, make it clearer in this paper why these themes are so dominant or why, or maybe even try to, to see why I'm reading it the way I'm reading it. Um, and I, um, I, I also wanted to, to because you started um, by looking at the whole narrative of apathy that they're putting up, is that, isn't it a narrative? Isn't it part, I mean, we have many storytellers, right? So this story of um, no activity, no nothing happening now, isn't it? a narrative that someone has put up because they want to project a certain image. Is it a, exactly what is on, on the reality on the ground, even if we took one year, like last year, and evaluated? So for me, um, Professor, what, one of the things that um, I'm very interested in in your book is the narrating of um, a character. Um, he said, he said in this paper, maybe they should be the voice of Mayanja. I, I, I don't quite agree it should be there. I am more interested in further analysis of um, the voices that are constructing Mayanja. Why are they constructing him this way? I thought the voice of Mayanja should be, uh, Professor, a separate paper where we have Mayanja's voice and how, and maybe other voices as a, a backdrop. But this, this, these voices are constructing Mayanja in a certain way. They are, they, the, they are focalizing, they're, they're, they're zooming in and, uh, and making certain statements and drawing certain character, character portraits of him. Why is my interest. I don't know if I'm just a literature student, so I don't know. If I next <laughs> yeah. Do you want to respond to me? To, yeah. Very important. You've raised a very important question, which sincerely I didn't uh, focus on. I didn't. Uh, race that the imperialism actually prepares the type of politician or try to, pro to prepare the type of politician they wanted to govern. They try to shape the post-independent political actor in their own image, of course, uh, just as God has created us in, our, in his own image, we are told. <laughs> but the point you are raising, the politics of choice and all that is very, very important. And I'm sorry, I don't think I really addressed them, but they do now come to mind. And as I, as I, I reflect on what I've written, uh, this is a very important point to make. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.
several hands here. There's also a question online from uh, Professor uh, Holly Hansen. Oh, I don't know if uh, I Hol know. Holly, if you would like to uh, unmute and ask the question, uh, uh, please go ahead if that's if Is that's that possible. Holly yes. Sure. Hello. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, Professor Kosozi, thank you for this fascinating paper. The question I'd like to ask has to do with what Cohen might be thinking that we can't see in what he writes. And um, I think that although the, the plan for independence had been made, there were many governors who were not as in favor of it as yeah. As 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 Cohen and and maybe a few others were. So I wonder, do you think it could be possible that part of Cohen's motivation was to put Mayanja at Cambridge, and then that would force other um, people in the colonial administration to see this really smart person succeeding at Cambridge? And then also, is it possible, and he couldn't have said this either, that, that he's trying to say something to Ugandans in, in giving Mayanja this really fat scholarship? Because is, is he, could he be saying independence is coming and things are going to be different? Here's a Muslim. Here's a Muslim who started a strike and he gets a reward. Is that kind of, is he possibly reframing, like sort of demonstrating to Ugandans a different kind of intention? And of course, there's, there's no evidence because he couldn't put that in writing. So I'm just asking you to speculate. And thank you very much. Yeah, shall I answer that? Yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, uh, Cohen, Cohen was extremely intelligent, as you know. I don't think he, from one person he would have made a team, uh, but he saw him uh, in his letter to uh, to the to Cambridge. He saw him as one of the most brilliant people who he had uh, to uh, support. But he's a uh, he's a he's a secretary for African Affairs. Boy, thought Mayanja should. Be very good in the civil service, he, and he thought Mayanja could be taken as the headmaster of Kibuli Secondary School because there were very few Muslim Muslim teachers. So, so I don't think Cohen would be deceived that one person would make all the difference. Uh, he, but he he was, I think, showing the uh, the, the the other people uh, uh, that. Uh, People who are intelligent should be supported, and that, and he had written earlier on that Africa lacks brilliant nationalists, and that a lot of problems, a lot of pressures are put on them, and that the Mayanja should be really educated. So I think that is we shouldn't expand it to the point that he had a, he saw Mayanja as one of the. Uh, future presidents of, of Africa, I mean, of Uganda. But mind you, unlike others, he was away of the 1947 uh, plans. He's the one who did, actually, he was the architect. Uh, only he had been demoted to Uganda from the colonial office. But he was the architect uh, of the plan to decolonize Africa without violence and to make Africa stay within the British uh, Commonwealth. Uh, uh, and uh, to, to him, that was key. He was very, very, uh, what you might say, uh, attached to the UK. And he wanted these colonies to stay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Mayanja talked a lot with Majare Paham. And Majare Paham was trying try to tell Mayanja that, look, you are better off under the British. Uh, uh, communi community, uh, and uh, uh, under uh, that you shouldn't rush independence. And I, I, I think also Cohen didn't want to rush independence. So I think uh, that's all I can say about that. I don't think that uh, the taking of Mayanja alone was seen as a 
by Cohen as an example or as a starting of a flood of students is that that's what he believed in, that this person should be helped. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, maybe if, if Dr. Skeeto can jump in and then uh, we'll sort of. How, how is your new job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, eh? <laughs> All right. There's a lot of politics now there. Yeah? You are not part of it. Eh? <laughs> uh, Professor Kasozi, I'm yeah. coming back uh, briefly a bit. Um, what if, uh, although Andrew Cohen was uh, one of the architects of the 1947 uh, decolonization uh, plan rooted in uh, the aftermath of the Second World War, and the creation of the United Nations, but also giving birth to the universal declaration of uh, human rights, 1948, in which the concept of decolonization is, and self-governance is well embedded. But what if was Cohen was such a smart politician who wanted to stifle political activism? Because the taking away of Abmayanja so much affected the activities of the Uganda National Congress. People like Kemusazi and Kasbat Obwangol much relied on Abmayanja. And when he was away, the activities were kind of I, still. No, I, I think it would be unfair to, uh, to Sir Andrew Cohen. Sir Andrew Cohen was genuine in helping Mayanja to get educated and having as many nationalists educated as possible. It is true when Mayanja left the Uganda National Congress, they, they didn't have somebody to write and draft their papers and, uh, and they do most of the intellectual work. But I don't think Sir Andrew Cohen aimed at paralyzing uh, the Uganda National Congress. If anything, I think he wanted to make him brilliant. I mean, make him more informed uh, yeah. of what was going on and therefore to help, to help and, the Congress more. And lastly, was the Ab Mayanja in any way related to Josh Mayanja and Ganji? No, no relation. So Professor Galola, uh, go ahead. Uh, just pr press, uh, uh, if someone, yeah. Oh, it's not working. Yeah. Yes. Stand. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm called Moses Gurula, and I used to teach here 40 years ago, is it? God knows. Uh, that's yeah, 40 years ago. Because I left in 82. He's my senior brother and also senior colleague. Um, in 1966, a new constitution was promulgated, so-called the Pigeon Hall Constitution. And there's a fellow in Mbale who said that even though we hadn't seen the constitution, it's the best document that has been produced in Uganda. Now, I haven't seen the whole book that Kasozi is producing, but I can tell you it's an excellent work. Uh, I want to make two comments. One, that something similar in a slightly different context was happening in Kenya when Ali Mazrui, a very great friend of Abmayanja, was also picked up in Mombasa by a governor of the day. I don't remember the name. Yes. And uh, he found a Muslim again, a Muslim young man who had applied to come here to join Makerere but did not have the necessary credits. I think it have a credit in English and therefore was denied admission to Makerere. And uh, the governor found that he was very sh a good speaker and also gave him a scholarship. I think his time was Oxford. Anyway, one of those, the top, the top universities in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. Now, um, I don't like to be very academic. I've been away for so long. But 
Does history teach us any lessons? Can we learn anything? As African academics and leaders, does this teach us anything? Do we have a second chance? Can we give a second chance to individuals who appear cantacaras? I don't know whether that's the right word. At, uh, at King's College Budo, uh, which where I had the opportunity to study for a few years, the headmaster sometimes dismissed the young fellows who were too ambitious, but then found them places in other schools within Kampala. And usually would say something like, this boy is brilliant, but he can't survive the highly disciplinary you know, context in my care. Or we can't keep all the rules. Or this young man wants to cross there's a boundary there, you know, he crosses the boundary where it shouldn't be. The point is that uh, he didn't want to destroy you when we said to you, leave Budo, but we should find another place for you where the environment suits you better. Now, in academic and other areas, as African leaders, do we give a second chance to our own? Uh, would we have a Mayanja Wuda, the current leadership? allow a Mayanja to thrive. Can this happen more and more? Even the students, those of you who are lecturers, teachers, do we give, do you believe in second chances? Or do we say, get out of here? Enough is enough. We have had enough of you. This is something which I've been thinking about. And uh, to me, Mayanja, I, I knew him. He used to give very brilliant lectures and uh, easily one of the best brains in this country, but I know there are many others who would have performed as well, but who were stifled, who are oppressed at a much earlier stage and were not given a, a second chance. I do believe that history sometimes teaches lessons, and one of the lessons you can pick from colonial masters is that we too should be able to identify the potential in each individual and cultivate it. Thank you. <laughs> that same man who was one was my teacher here and he said that when my career gave him a professorship, that's when he forgave my career. Otherwise, he was always unhappy that he had been refused <laughs> to study here. Yeah. You, so the, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, okay, so we have, why don't we take a round of questions? Yes, right. Uh, so that we, because I know we're, we're, uh, we're going uh, over time. But if uh, Dr. Tununuche and then uh, Nora and Christopher, can they say uh, their names? Yeah, and also, yeah, oh. exactly. Uh, and you'll have to come up to the uh, the microphone, so <laughs> you kind of come here, so everyone online can be uh, can hear. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor uh, Edgar, for this opportunity, and thank you very much, Professor, for this wonderful uh, paper and the book. Uh, I am Nicolas Tunanuche, a history student. I would like professor to paint a picture of a post-independent Uganda based on uh, the 1947 uh, decolonization plan. I am uh, uh, the, the planned exit. I am asking this uh, if uh, uh, the sources allowed you uh, to see or pick up figures or statistics of, for instance, the deliberate increase in the institutions of higher learning in uh, Uganda or the intake of students at high at uh, 
a higher level so that the number could increase to prepare the administrators in a later period, given the fact that Uganda had got a chance of having an architect of this grand plan. Thank you. Um, now that Cohen had come and Uganda had got a chance of having the architect of the grand decolonization plan. Was there any deliberate attempt either to increase the intake or uh, establish higher institutions? And best thing on that, would you paint a picture of an administration of an independent Uganda on the basis of this exit plan. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. My name is uh, Nakamuka Nora, an MS student, and I am happy to be part of this discussion. I uh, have read most of your works, uh, the bitter bread, the article about the 12 lessons from uh, the Makere food strike, um, among others. I was, I also felt happy when, uh, when uh, this seminar was called because I did my last course work in Uganda was about Abu Mayanja and how the colonial education shaped his political career. My question is, was Mayanja, Abu Mayanja able to live up to the expectations of the Muslims and the Uganda people who brought him into the political arena? Uh, um, uh, Badu Kakunglu, Mlangira Badu Kakunglu, and Sheikh Hari Kulumba were the people that looked for his scholarship in Budo. Uh, they brought him to the political scene of Uganda to promote and uh, be able to advocate for Muslim in Uganda and uh, be able to secure uh, political positions for the Muslims in Uganda? Was he able to live up to those expectations? And what was the agenda of Abu Mayanja in his political career? Uh, the other, what was his? The last, three. the last question was, uh, what was the agenda of Abu Mayanja's political career? And uh, what was his political ideology? Because we see he is a man a very political intellectual that served in all the governments of Uganda until his death in November 2005. So which side of the political spectrum, uh, because when you, I, I studied Mayanja, but his political career is kind of confusing. We see him uh, supporting the, contra uh, the conservatives in Uganda because he was one of the members that drafted the Namirembe Agreement of 1955. And then we see him going against Uganda and the Indians when he said that no group in Uganda should be given special treatment. So where was he falling? Was he a conservative? Was he a Democrat? Uh, and then I need a clarification. I want, uh, Professor, I want to draw your attention to page 13. I don't know whether, you, uh, yeah, page 13, the second paragraph. It says the replacement of the portrait of King George the sixth with the Kawaka. Abu Mayanja entered King's College Budo in 1942. That is when, no, in 1945. That is when he was admitted in Budo as a student. Uh, the, uh, the strike in Budo about the uh, changing of a uh, portrait of King George and uh, the coronation of the Kabaka happened in 1949. So I want a clarification on that. And the other thing is, do you agree with uh, Carol Summer and uh, Jonathan Al? Jonathan Al in his article, uh, Colonial Buganda and the End of the Empire, he says, he describes Abu Mayanja as an irresponsible sense, uh, an irresponsible person driven by a uh, sense of fun. And then Karo Sama in his article, Adolescence and Politics, he describes him as an immature and reckless. Uh, and reckless. Uh, what do, do you agree with those statements? Because if you see, he was, uh, 
these controversies in uh, Bumayanja's political career because we see he he's going against the people that uh, lobbied for his scholarship to go at in Cambridge. On the same page, page 13 from your book, it says, on 18th July 1956, Cohen wrote a special letter to Mayanja in the spirit of early correspondence, telling him that the latter article in the tribunal of 13th July 1956, projecting him as an irresponsible governor was not true. So uh, Andrew Cohen lobbied for uh, the scholarship of uh, Babu Mayanja to go in Cambridge, and then he later turns around and writes these absurd things about him. So is it true that he was driven by the sense of uh, fun and all that? Thank you very much. Yes, we did. We did. Uh, so you want to respond? Maybe two more. Yes, okay. okay. All right. Let's do it. People, no, I think not. Uh, it's not there. Okay. People to leave uh, to the expect expectations of Muslims. I, I think to some extent you can say that, and I have. Uh, I have a whole chapter, Mayanja and the Muslim question, in the sense that he defended Islam and the Muslims in the parliament and, uh, and uh, uh, Chibuli against the national NAM. So he really defended, uh, he defended the, the Muslims. Now, Binais and others, and obviously he was a lapsed Muslim. You know, in his early days, he was quite lapsed. And uh, what was the agenda of Abu Mayanja? And I'm, I'm sure you've read uh, Al, yeah, Al's uh, piece on Mayanja, where, Maya, where Al says that Mayanja was driven, Mayanja's political career was driven by the defense of Islam, you know, uh, which I think is is partly true. Have you heard of this story of the seven blind men of Hindustan and the elephant? Huh? You've heard of that story? Each blind man who touched the elephant gave the description of the elephant where he had touched. If you, <laughs> if you touched the tusk, you, you thought, ah, oh, it is like a horn. If you touched the body, it is like a wall. Yes. To some extent, Abu um, Mayanya defended the Muslim Islam. But when you when you read the the parliamentary reports from 1964 to 1974, Mayanya was possibly the main critic, the main speaker, the main the, the, the main uh, person you hear, and they called him the demand back of Uganda because he spoke so much. Actually, his most brilliant performance was in the parliament. And so, yes, he shifted from side to, to from party to party, but I think he never gave up a number of things. First and foremost, Mayanja was a Democrat. He believed in a liberal Democrat. He believed in the separation of powers. Second, he, he, he believed um, he worked he, against the mango when the mango was not democratic. However, as I will show next week uh, in the next seminar, uh, in the packaging of this, the, uh, the state, uh, the post-colonial state, Mayanja and other politicians really wanted independence quick. And they wanted, they patched up, as I see we say, an agreement without thinking very seriously about it. And even if Ingira in his book says they didn't think very seriously about it, they thought that the British were not interested in going. They didn't know that the British were actually bent on going, but they, they really wanted the independence. And the manager was one of those, and he didn't go above the shoulders of the others to say, hey, let's stop. Uh, is independence for the sake of it necessary? Should we go into this argument? But in fact, he didn't 
get on that. So was he conservative? No, he was not. I think he was democratic and he worked with Mengo for some time, but he believed in the Kabaka institution, very much so. And as you remember, in the, the, the CA or the National Resistance Council, he defended the return of the traditional rulers very much. So, so he believed in, a, uh, in, in traditional rulers. And as I show, I'll show you in a subsequent seminars, his beliefs transformed. First, he believed in a, Uganda, a united Uganda, right? And he believed in the unit of Uganda. But later on, when he moved around Uganda, he changes to believing in unity, not in uniformity, right? He believed in the unit of Uganda, but not in, in uniformity, in the sense that he believed that the, 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 the package of Uganda should allow differences according to levels of development. And he thought, and this he says, that kingships and the monarchies are some of the best political organizations Africa has developed. And therefore they are worth keeping without executive powers. So yes, I do agree that and uh, in my book there is that chapter that he he was interested in he was a fan um, and uh, not so not only Al who say who who says that our former uh, founder of the history department Kenneth Ingham in his book also refers to him as a, a person who was not very serious. Because I mean, with Obote, he, he was going to be the leader, but he said, yeah, you take off, you take, take this. And so Obote obviously <laughs> jumped on it. <laughs> In the party, jumped on it, <laughs> you know? So all these could, could be true, but I think we shall discuss that. Um, Immature, reckless by Carol Summers, I would not go that far. I would not go to that far. Obviously, yes, he wrote a very bad article against his mentor and called him a dictator, called him Sir Andrew Cohen a dictator. Uh, and uh, Sir Andrew Cohen said, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> you know? I did, and then Andrew Cohen wrote him a letter, this thing, and telling him the reasons why he was acting like that. And, and Cohen had actually recommended the Mayanja for a, a temporary job uh, in the Brown, uh, in, in a newspaper to work, but Mayanja turned it out. They kept, whenever Mayanja came for holiday, Andrew Cohen would call him. And one day, Andrew Cohen said, uh -uh, I felt like I was back in the Kings, Kings being the Kings College. So they, they were friends. So I think you know that we you should attend all my uh, scheduled uh, seminars. There is a lot to learn about Ugandan politics through the study of this one man who, uh, who saw it through from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, Nicholas, was there a plan to increase higher education enrollment, right? I think the plan was general. Uh, it didn't focus on, uh, uh, on, um, on higher education enrollment as such. However, that the plan 1947 plan utilized two earlier plans done by Lord Hale. Lord Hale did African survey, published in 1938. And then another one, 
published, I think two years later, on native administrations. In both those studies, Lodi Haere emphasized the economic development of Africans. And through, in that, he also emphasized education as being one of the components of, of development. And as I have said earlier, a committee, a commission of the Asquith had been uh, had, uh, studied higher education and submitted their report. And it is upon that report that university colleges affiliated to the University of London uh, were, was made, were, the decision was made, and that's why you are at Makerere. So let's see. Yeah, we have, we're going to take another couple rounds. So, uh, Professor Devo, do you want to close the floor? Maybe just. Sorry, sorry. Professor Kasozi, I don't think you have satisfied us unless you are sure us that you are going to tell us in the subsequent chapters. Why did uh, Abu Mayanja aspire to be a leader. Because you see, leadership, I think politics is about power, power, a control, and influence. It was very evident that this fellow was very influential and had the potential to lead, either lead in Uganda or the whole of Uganda. Did he have that aspiration? Do you find it anywhere, anywhere in his writings? Yes. So when did he really get it? Because there were many chances that he should go. To, should have <laughs> I, first of all, Kenneth Ingham <clears throat> say, says it all <clears throat> in his book, Obote, a political biography, in which Obote took over the, the Uganda National Congress. Mayanja refused to take over that job. Why? I don't know. So Obote took uh, that's what. Secondly, Mayanya, a colonial officer, and I have that, wrote that of all the politicians, Mayanya is the most uncorrupt, and the, he's not in politics for money. He's in politics for a higher, uh, I call it a higher, a higher, a higher uh, the ideals. Than any other. And up to the end of his day, he's, he was in the government virtually all of his life as a minister. No corruption case was ever brought against him. Nothing. Neither did he accumulate wealth. <clears throat> so you are, you are looking at a different type of person. But I mean, he. he as we say, that, that question, I answer it in, 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 uh, in one of the chapters where I say, were people, uh, were people correct in investing in Mayanja? Because in 1952, the, the Bifa was calling him the Nkrumah, Nkrumah of Uganda. Mm -hmm. But he never became the Nkrumah. And why? Why? I try to answer it in one of the chapters. I think it's chapter nine, a full chapter. One of the, one of the, he was very arrogant and extremely intelligent in that when you spoke with him, he knew what you were talking and you would answer, not politely, <laughs> very rude, in many cases, very rude. Huh? One of his sons, and he has he had a many sons. Oh yeah, and that's part of his weakness. Better believe that. <laughs> yes, yes, and he says any any you know any of his own children who is not clever <laughs> was <laughs> not his son. <laughs> <laughs> <scary. laughs> so I think he. Yeah, I, I, I think these, these are questions that I try to grapple with. And that's why the book has taken me so long to, uh, to complete. 
because there is so much and uh, there is so much, but those questions are answered. But there's no book which can answer everything. Exactly, thank you very much. <laughs> Neither, no, nobody can answer everything. Yes, but I haven't answered that here. My friend, you answer quite a lot. No, I think I have. Mm -hmm. There is, excuse me for coming, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, is it a local nation or somebody like that who say that uh, Mayanja is a man who never grew? Do you remember that expression? Uh, a Kenadoko. It's a Kenadoko. Yeah. yeah, a kind of a man who never grew up. Yeah, a Kenadoko. But he was always playing and just, <laughs> yeah, but, he, yeah, but you. You couldn't uh, defeat him in argument, but he was you. He would argue with you like a, a, a child. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Edgar, for this opportunity, and thank you very much, Professor, for your um, your work. I'm glad Dr. Pamela is now here. I just wanted to make a formal um, thank you to you for, for introducing us to, to this Mayanja in, in our um, course. So um, I'm very glad that now I'm seeing the author and the brains behind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, so thank you very much. My question um, is, is about access to knowledge in the process of knowledge production. Um, my name is Sogingo Christopher. I am an MA student. And why am I asking this question? Because um, my topic is about decolonization, first of all, um, decolonizing museum um, spaces and practices. And one of the problem I find is access to some of the information that I keep finding in some of the sources I read. And when I read your paper, most of the sources are actually not from here. And I am worried or I'm curious to know at what stage in your study did you have access to this um, rich source? Um, and what was the process like? Because we know from the other world of fossils and archaeology and so on, we know quite a number of things are uh, lying in museums in Europe and, and, and universities, uh, what they call prototype fossils or artifacts, which actually um, com source communities do not have access, easy access to them in, 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 in doing studies. And the same thing that applies to some of these resources, especially in archives. Um, I was introduced to archives um, in, in our first year of the course, and I didn't know about archives and when we went there, all of us actually realized um, how important archives are and quite a number of materials are out. So in the aspect or in the realm of Operation Legacy, did you find in your sources, did you find um, some of these materials that could have been in Uganda, but they're actually lying out there? And if it is the case, what would be the the um the responsibility or what would be the role of african universities to debate this kind of resource to come back here because somebody may say but we also write using your archives in uganda but yes you have the resources i may not be having the resources to access what is out there so what should be the role of universities or institutions that are responsible to ensure that we start debating about the return of these resources such that we have an easy access about these resources. And my last question is, Professor, where do you see the discipline of history, especially when we have um, you know, controversies of political agendas of, of our country? I guess um, when I ask that, we know what I'm talking about. You have people talking about history and other disciplines not relevant for this country. Where do you see history for that matter? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I know your name again? Stop. 
Sorry. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Gasozi, for this interesting uh, presentation. My name is Samuel Nyasha Chikoero. I'm a student of history. Uh, let me start by uh, admitting that this is my first time I'm reading uh, about uh, Mayanja, but I found your paper very interesting, uh, given the fact that um, this kind of sources that you make use of uh, archival, uh, which is my area. So, but again, archival sources, they tell us more about the perspectives of the colonialists, especially in this case. So I was also interested to know about other maybe perspectives that are not, also, that are not only from the colonial, colonialists or these colonial officials. Uh, for example, on page um, 12, you say Mayanja was uh, considered as a rebel by some of the colonial officials. So is it the same uh, view that was being shared by more other people in the colonial society who are not necessarily colonial officials? This Maybe this could uh, be, we can also find the answers maybe from non-archival uh, sources. And um, again, it, it, I found your paper to be interest is interesting again in the sense that it's, um, it can also be situated in this Cold War uh, debate, right? So I, I thought when I was reading again the paper, I thought that maybe the sending of Abu Mahanja to, to study uh, outside Uganda was also a strategy by the colonial government, it, maybe to use uh, Dr. Zaid's uh, statement to stifle this nationalist uh, activism in, in Africa. So, as a way of uh, trying to counter the Soviet influence in Africa. So yeah, that's my submission there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for those questions. And could I, uh, I think the point about archives is really important. And I know it's something we haven't, I didn't uh, mention in the introduction, but also your Professor Kasozi's work in advocating on behalf of Uganda's archives. Uh, and I, you know, so I think, I, I uh, I wanted to just echo that question about about sources, uh, and then I had another sort of comment on you know it strikes me in this paper that it, it shows often there's a um, distinction between those leaders who were went and were educated at Makerere and in the UK, and those who were educated in India or who went to Russia or the Soviet Union. Um, or to um, uh, not cases that I know of from Uganda, but from other African countries who were educated at historically black colleges in the United States and often were radicalized by, say, Nehru or, or, or communist ideology. But I think what you show here is that it, these weren't narrow one-way streets, that Abu Mayanja goes to London and that for, for, the, for his colonial minders, that's supposed to be a one-way ticket. Supposed to be, he's supposed to go to London. He's supposed to, uh, or go, sorry, go to Cambridge. Be have a similar education to the education that most colonial administrators get got at Cambridge, uh, and then come back and be a proper administrator. But he sees it as a gateway to visit the Soviet Union, to engage with labor politicians. Uh, so I wonder if there's, you know, I, I, I've written and made a distinction between, say, Mayanja's generation and the generation of uh you know a bit i can't call i'm calling it a generation it was only like two years later <laughs> uh but of, of say john kakonge kirundiki vajinja bidandi sali who go to to india for education and are taken under the wing of nehru um but i i, I wonder if you if you have any thoughts on um uh the meaning you know what what was the route that mayanja was following in his in his mind when he goes to uh, to Cambridge, because I think it sounds very different from you know it's it's fascinating to see as as Professor Chiguli was asking how he was being framed, how he was being by various interests within um, say by Cohen for example, uh, but then you know he's he's quickly 
from the moment of arrival, he's evaded any, <laughs> you know, what they what they want or think he's going to do. From the very moment he arrives, he's already outside of their their control. Um, and it just strikes me, you know, what echoed in my mind was there's a, uh, I think it's a uh, in a book by historian uh, um, um, Rinalini Sinha, who writes about the Indian civil service in the late 1800s and about how colonial administrators are very anxious that within a generation, they're sending their best educated civil servants to India. And yet the Indian civil servants are just blatant, like obviously smarter than, than the British uh, uh, civil servants that they've, they've sent. And it seems like Mayanja is at one hand, he's a, he's a, for Cohen, like a success, you know, successful, you know, the kind of person that they want to, um, um, to advance. On the other hand, he's also threatening not, and I think it's not, the threat, threat maybe not just that he's starting strikes, but he's a threat because he's proving that <clears throat> um, a, not just a Ugandan, but a Muslim Ugandan who is just obviously smarter than uh, not just of his peers within Uganda, but then, but smarter than many British administrators. Um, and so I wonder if, it, yeah, just asking you maybe to, I, I think it's, it, it's significant here that it's he Mayanja is not just competing with others within Uganda, but he's actually sort of taking he's unsettling the very idea of British superior intellectual superiority or or um, that was a foundation for colonial rule. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think I will start with you. Uh, yes, you are right. There is a distinction, and I think the colonial officers who are right and the Cohen who are right that higher education actually influences the person who receives it. As you said, the people who went to India, John Kakonge, Irunda Chivejinja, Vidandi Sari, Chintu Musoke, most of these people became, you would say radical, but became, they had no respect for the British Commonwealth and the Empire. I wouldn't say values, but the difference between Mayanja and them is this, that Mayanja believed in the Westminster model far more as, as, you know, as without changing. He believed in the separation of powers, the judiciary, the, the, the independence of the judiciary, the supremacy of parliament, and a, an executive who is the first among his equals, right? So Mayanja believed in that. The, the people who went to India believed in executive presidency, where all the powers are concentrated, the presidency. And uh, they believed very strongly in the role of the state uh, uh, in, in the economy. But Mayanja did not believe very strongly. He didn't oppose it, but he didn't believe strongly in the role of the state. Uh, in fact, he opposed uh, Saanu Kohen on that issue. So you are right. And, uh, and my paper, actually, this is what my paper is saying, that the education that you give is a political cake and that it, it actually frames, and that the colonial officers uh, were completely correct in their point of view, that they, first of all, they will not be gener you know, generous with higher education. They, will, if, if, if they couldn't deny it. By 1940, after Lord Haile had been in Africa, they, they came to the conclusion that the welfare of the colonized was very important. So edu education was there. They couldn't deny it. So, okay, what type of education? It's better give that education at home. And once it is at home, then you have control of it. 
But if people go abroad, then you must control. And as you see in my paper, there was a struggle to prevent Mayanja from going to India or, or the U USA. Uh, and people, most of the people went to India. And part of the reason Mayanja fell, fell out with the Kalekezi, I didn't bring the picture of Kalekezi, who was the father of Kaihura, who was a, a friend of Mayanja, the, the National Congress, and was based in Cairo. And they were recruiting students uh, to India and the uh, Iron Cut it. And the colonial government didn't like it because they knew precisely that the education will shape the mind uh, of the people. And as you say, there is a difference between the, that group of radicals, of, uh, of a group of people who studied in India and those who studied abroad. And people say if Mayanja had gone to India, he would probably be more aggressive than he was. And he probably might have been a leader uh, of the country than uh, what than he played the second video instead. So then the question of archives, I'm going to ask both his question and the sources. Yes, I I, I must say I used the Entebbe archives when they were still in Entebbe. And I, I used whatever little I could get in the archives. But I, ha I was lucky that I've been to more archives, uh, the UK archives. Now, I personally don't think that they should return uh, the, the, the papers they have. I think they can do it electronically because if they bring them back, when you fight over the state again, we might destroy them. And uh, many of these papers have been found uh, uh, tying Mandazi. So I think if they are electric, fine, that will be good. Now Pamela has gone. We founded an archival society and we are asking you to join it with the aim of uh, preserving the archives. Because as historians, you really have a stake in the archives. I understand that the Minister of Lands have gone out of the archives. Is it true? Um, I think three of the ministries have brought their papers to the, yes. to the archives. I, I forget if land. No, no, but the, the, the whole building, the new building. Oh, the, yeah. the new building was occupied by land's office. Yeah. Now, I think the commission is now in disbanded, control. but they've given back the building, but the public service still uses most of the building for their other uh -huh. uh, units, I think. Yeah, so, they don't know the use of the archives. And it's only you people to defend the archives. First of all, if you join this society, our role will not to tell the public service to get out, but to sensitize the people to the importance of depositing records in archives and the government to take a more keen, uh, keen, keen because right now, all the papers being produced by the ministries are not sent to London for keeping. London has up to independence. They have them. You, you, you know, when you go to, to the Uganda section, you feel you are in Uganda. They have them, they are there. Yes, I was privy to this and um, I don't regret it because most of the papers I wanted, I would get. So I think, talk to Pamela and uh, they, we shall be asking you to be members and possibly somewhere in October we should meet and let's see how we go forward. Uh, there is a question which uh, I was asked, where is history going? Uh, because I think the, the current policy is to emphasize science. And uh, I, I, I thought that uh, that policy is good, that uh, but to say that history is useless and arts are useless is not right. But I think a person is both a physiological and a philosophical animal. So we need to study both. And when I was at the National Council, we were discussing a plan whereby 
all students, all students study both history and arts, like you do in the US. So that in the second year, you choose to major in one or either science or arts, but at the same time, you have again subjects from the other side. The thing is that you can't compartmentalize knowledge up to the, to the level where you drop history or literature completely or mathematics or biology. You need these things in life. So I think the people who are saying arts are useless are themselves ignorant uh, of the human body. The human body needs both. You need a political organization. You need social organization. You need a doctor, you need light, you need buildings, you need everything. So the best way would be for us to teach our children both these both areas, and then later on they can drop. So I, I, I don't know what, uh, when we left the National Council, whether they continued with that debate. But to me, that was my strategy. And I've just talked to the rector of IUIU, where I, I have uh, a position as head of the academic committee of Senate, no, of the council, that they should try to look at that curriculum change. We need a curriculum change. Then history will not have anything to fear. Isn't that so? Because as historians, we really need to study biology. <laughs> we need the physics. We need everything. So why, why should we say? So I think that's it. Is it? Thank you very much. And we've gone. Uh, uh, sorry, we've uh, abused uh, the the clock by. Uh, going well over our, our advertised time, but really uh, we could, I feel like this conversation could go on much longer and, but I'm just glad that this is the first of 10, uh, you said 10 seminars? If I so, get spot. Yes. So the next one will be uh, for everyone next week, Wednesday uh, at Miser at, uh, I believe at two o'clock yes. uh, from two to five. Uh, and we, we don't have our own seminar on Wednesday, so we're, we all should, uh, I hope that history will turn up in, in good numbers for that one as well. Uh, and, you know, we're, uh, in addition to looking forward to the book, uh, you know, looking forward to more of these conversations, uh, because they've been very, very thought provoking for all of us. So thank you very much to Professor Kasozi. Dr. Rudabajuka, Dr. Skito, and everyone uh, for joining us uh, here and online uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much.